Hi everyone, welcome to the Climate Confident Podcast. My name is Tom Raftery and with me on the show today I have my special guest Anya. Anya, welcome to the podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Tom, and really happy to be here. So, yes, my name is Ani Frade. I'm uh, the COO of Vertsilas Energy Business and really happy to be here. Thank you. And for people who might be unaware, Anja, can you give us a few words about Vertsilia? Yes, with pleasure. So Vertsilia is a leading company in uh, innovative technologies and life cycle solutions both in the energy and marine sector. So our mission is really to shape the decarbonization of both both marine and energy. And I represent the energy business and our vision is that we we envision basically the future to be 100% renewable. And, and with our flexible technologies, we also support our customers to achieve their net zero targets. Okay, I guess the first question is why, as in, Wartzilla Energy is an energy business. Have you taken this as kind of a, a mission to help your customers decarbonize? Is, is that the the only aim or have you other aims as well? You know, what what's the strategy here? Yeah, I think maybe before I, I answer the question, I would take a step back. So when we look at the energy future, we are moving towards a renewable energy future. And when we look at the future energy systems, we see that, that the base uh, load energy will come from renewables, but to build sustainable and secure energy system, you, would, you will need flexible assets. And that's really where the core of Vatsila energy business comes in. So we provide the flexibility for, for the future systems. And in that way, we can help customers and, and our countries also to decarbonize. Okay, and when you say flexible assets, what do you mean when you refer to flexible assets? So in our portfolio, we have uh, flexible engine power plants that currently run on gas, but we are putting a lot of effort into our R&D development also to, to develop solutions which can use sustainable fuels like hydrogen or ammonia or methanol. So that's one part of the portfolio. And the other part of the portfolio is our energy storage solutions. And then in, in addition to that, we have a digital platform also, which is a power system optimization platform that we can offer to our customers. And of course, then we support our customers throughout the life cycle of the plants and uh, technologies. So for 25 years or so. Okay, great. So when you refer to your customers, who would your customers typically be? Are we talking, it's, it's not residential, obviously, but it's... Commercial, are we talking large customers, small, what kind of size, what kind of portfolios are we talking about? Yeah, I think we have a super varied portfolio of customers. So we talk about utilities, we talk about industrial customers, but more like the, let's say, grid connected. So bigger customers, clearly, and uh, which are connected to, to the grid. Or then the industrial customers also, for example, mining, mining customers are, are part of our customer portfolio. Okay. And for those customers, how are you helping them on their decarbonization journey? Is it that you're in helping them install renewables? Is it that you are helping them shape demand? You know, what, what, what are kind of strategies or does it depend from customer to customer, region to region, all that kind of thing? Yeah, I think what we, where we usually start the journey is we have an in-house power system modeling team and where we start is to really look at the big picture. So as I mentioned, we, we model like the future power systems. So where are we today and where do we need to be? And in that way, we can plan the future, our customers' future system. So if they have certain assets today, they want to be net zero by, let's say, 2050, we can plan that path for them. So which are the assets that they would need to invest in? How, how does their optimal portfolio look like? And then they have, then they have the road, they have the path towards the targets that they set. So usually we start from, from that discussion and uh, when the path is clear, then it's easier to start making the investment decision. But of course it depends a bit from customer to customer. Some of, some customers already have the plan in place, uh, others don't, so case by case. But I think this approach is, is very like long-term. You look at our customers from a long-term perspective to, to really ensure that they build the optimal system for their future and optimal portfolio as well. 
Okay. And do things like battery storage come into it as well? Yeah, usually I think when we have modeled the different paths, is it for a country or a region or, or a customer, what we see is that the path is very similar for everyone. So what makes most sense is to add a lot of renewables because it's the cheapest way to produce electricity today. So there is a very strong incentive, like economical incentive to, to invest in renewables today. So what we see is the first step of the path is to invest in renewables. What you need then is to start investing also into the flexibility because the renewables, as we know, they are intermittent, so they are variable. They don't always produce electricity. So in the moments when you don't have the electricity, you need to have the flexible assets that you can utilize. So is it then energy storage for a shorter period of time or then flexible engine power plants that can ramp up when there, for example, is no wind or, or solar in, in that period of time. Uh, when you have done these two steps, so I invested in renewables and then into flexible assets, that's when you can start divesting or closing down some of the inflexible assets uh, in the portfolio, like for example, coal, and which are of course also heavy, heavy in terms of, of emissions. And then you continue with this cycle, and then uh, what we see towards, let's say, end of this decade, early 2030s, we see that there will be more availability of the future fuels. So when the availability of the future fuels will be enough, you can also start converting gas-based plants to use also sustainable fuels. And in that way, actually, you can reach a net zero system and completely de decarbonize the portfolio. So I think the steps are the same whether we talk about Indonesia or, or the United States, but, but the pace is different based on, on the different countries' ambitions also to reach, reach net zero targets. Okay. And what about things like shaping demand? Because as you mentioned, renewables are variable in their energy generation. And some in some times, in some places, and with different kinds of equipment, it can be possible to shape the demand to better meet the generation. Is that something you're looking at as well? Yeah, I think when we when we look at the demand side, so of course we look at the power system as a as a total, of course. So what makes most sense to to build, and I think the the topic is very much on the agenda today. So how to how to build out the future power system in such a way that it makes most sense. So we have different. Uh, different levers, different incentives for that. But I think the most most important point at the moment is that we need to get more renewables built and that will drive the demand then for flexible assets as well. So when the renewables can't operate only by themselves, <laughs> we cannot have just renewables. It needs to be coupled with the flexibility. So when, when there's more renewables in the system, that will also drive the demand for the flexibility. Okay. What about interconnects? I, I, I know we didn't discuss this on the intro call, but it, it strikes me as, as we're saying this, that if we're, if we're treating nation states as islands, then yeah, we need a lot more flexibility. But as we start to build more interconnects, then the sun is always shining and the wind is always blowing somewhere. There aren't enough interconnects right now, but as we tend, as we, as we interconnect more countries and more grids, then it starts to become less of an issue, no? Yeah, I think, uh, okay, here, of course, geographies are large, so <laughs> it depends on, on where you are. But of course, the, the grid is also an area that needs to be modernized. And, and here, uh, it's very much depending on the countries. And we can talk about the EU as one system, but then when we move, for example, to, to, the, to the United States, you can see that they are very disconnected already, the different states as such. So... I think there is quite a lot of work to do, but obviously, yes, it's it's one of the areas that, that we can also utilize. But but I think when the the distances get very far or far away, then then it can also be some constraints in terms of, of how you transfer the electricity. So but I think mm. all in all, yes, the grid modernization is of course one one piece of the puzzle as well. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. True, true. I take your point about the, the distances, but I think things like the large pipelines they've built in the United States show that uh, distances need not be an issue. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> I think if they can uh, transport if they can transport oil over thousands of miles, we can certainly transport electricity a lot more efficiently. But anyway, sorry, I, I, I digress. Um, yeah, I think uh, okay. One one uh, example I could take, which is very topical here in Finland, where I <laughs> where I live, but we have really good wind conditions in the north of of Finland. But of course, the the demand for electricity is not so high in the north of Finland, at sure. least yet. So what what they are also looking at is uh, you know how to how to transport that. Does it make more sense to to do it uh, through the grid, or do you convert the excess electricity into hydrogen and then you transport it somewhere else where it's needed? So I think this discussion is of course ongoing as well. Yeah, I think there was a similar issue in Germany as well, where uh, there is a, a lot of wind in the north and a lot of consumption done in Munich and Bavaria in the south. So. Yeah, it's, it's yep. going to be a common a common theme. But speaking of renewables, then for some of your customers, are you actually supplying or building out the renewables for them, or just making the recommendations, or somewhere in between? Yeah, we we mainly made the the recommendations towards our customers to to increase the the amount of renewables, and then as mentioned, what we really focus on is is the flexibility part. So that's really our core knowledge and core technology around how the engine power plants work and, and also the energy storage and then of course the software and, and the life cycle services. So that's where our focus lies. Okay, sure. And you have a, a power system optimization modeling that, that you've done in, in not just companies, but countries over 50 countries. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because you're, you're doing it at a country level seems to be quite a differentiator. No, I, I can't think of any other companies that I've come across that have gone and modeled power systems at the country level for as many countries as you have. Yeah, I think we have actually almost modeled every country in the world on, on some level of detail or the other, but I, I fully agree it's a, it's a differentiator in, in the industry and I think really one of our core core competencies as well. And so what we do, as I mentioned, this is really one of the sort of door openers as well. I mean, we, we talk with ministries around the world and really there to support in ensuring that we build the best future energy systems that we can. So taking what we have today, understanding what, where the targets need to be, and then building it in a cost optimal way so that we ensure that we are doing the right investments in the right technology at the right time to to achieve the targets that we set. But this is really, I mean, as mentioned, the key, key differentiator, I think, between us and, and many other companies and competitors, but very valuable for us as a company because we understand what the best options look like. So we also understand where the business opportunities, of course, are, but then it's really valuable for our customers and, and also for, for countries and decision makers to understand how to, how to do this in the right way. And what, what are the key kind of findings that you have from looking at the power systems across all these countries? Well, I think the key learning, I, I talked about the steps, so I think that's really one of the key learnings is that it doesn't depend on, on the country in a way, like the path is more or less the same. Everyone needs to go through the same steps, but the pace will be different. And of course, then it depends a bit also where, what's the starting point and where do you want to go? The conclusions are fairly similar actually in, in many of the modelings, but I think the interesting facts is then you know, when something happens, for example, the, the um, crisis we had in, in Europe, we have also modeled, you know, how Europe looks without Russian gas, what what makes sense to do for, for Europe in this type of scenario. So I think that from like a market intelligence point of view, it's also very interesting facts that, that we get out. And I think actually one other point I would like to highlight is still, we talk a lot about like innovation and new technologies also for for the future of, of the energy business. So if we have the right parameters for a, for a new technology, we can actually put that into the model as well to understand what the potential sort of potential for that technology is, uh, if it meets certain, certain criteria. So actually it's, it's super interesting. Okay. And how, 
hard or easy. I know I know it's impossible to quantify this, but I mean, you hear people say all the time that we can never have a grid that's 100% renewable. Do you agree? Well, I, I think we can have a grid that is 100% renewable, but uh, as said, it will take a bit of time. And of course, it, it will require us to convert assets that today like utilize fossil fuels to utilize sustainable fuels. So yes, it's, it is possible. I think usually when we talk about fully renewable grids, we talk about just renewables and storage. And that I think is, that's not a very, let's say cost efficient uh, way of doing it because you need to build out the system in that, uh, in a way that doesn't make economical sense, but when you. Uh, when you add the flexibility in terms of uh, of the gas gas based plants, which can be converted to future fuels, actually make a much more economical energy system, which also works in a very reliable way. And what are the main challenges to actually getting a one hundred percent renewable grid? Well, I think the good thing is that actually most of the pieces of the puzzle are, is already there, so mm. uh, we have renewables we have the technologies basically what we need now is a lot of re renewables deployment so that's of course the constraint is that we are not doing it at the pace we should actually i think permitting is a big issue on the renewables side we have a lot of projects stuck in, in permitting so i think that's a really big bottleneck at the moment but then i think we have many good things there already so i said technology is there we need to get the renewables on the ground. We need to we need to invest in, in new flexible capacity. And then the, further down the line, we, we, of course, need the renewable fuels as well. Okay. In terms of the permitting, is there, uh, and the permitting changes that we need to, to roll out, are there any countries that are doing it better than others? Any shining examples of places where the, the permitting isn't an issue versus others where there are kind of laggards? I don't have a specific on, on the <laughs> countries as such, but but I think uh, we are going in the right direction. I think there is a new directive also, renewable directive in, in EU. So they are clearly trying to decrease the time of, of permitting. So it's a step in the right direction, but, but still, I think we are quite far from the targets that where we should be. So um, I think we are sort of half half of the capacity that we should deploy on a yearly basis. So we have a long way to go, but but moving in the right moving in the right direction. Okay. So for countries or organizations that have existing fossil fuel plants or fossil fuel infrastructure in place, what do they do with that? Because you know there's a risk of it becoming a stranded asset if someone has built a gas-fired power plant or a coal-fired power plant, even worse, in the last five to 10 years, you know, they, they're they usually built with an expected lifetime of 30, 40, 50 years. And like I say, if it was built in the last five to 10 years, are they going to have to write that off now? I think it depends on, on the plant. I think, for example, what we try to do now or is that we invest quite heavily into the sustainable fuels developments for our products. So we develop currently engines for hydrogen, ammonia and methanol, just because, of course, first of all, we don't want to decarbonize our customers' operations, but then also ensure that if our customers invest today, it will not be a stranded asset. So. When the fuels will be available, basically we will also have a um, solution how you, how you can convert that plant to run on sustainable fuels. But to answer the question, I think it depends a bit on the plant. For a coal plant, I see it quite difficult. And and then I think some of the baseload gas plants as well, but depends a bit on the technology. And of course, we all, all want to make sure that we reduce emissions going forward. So. Uh, it might still be a better investment, actually, to have the the renewables coupled with the flexibility and and be able to close down some of the inflexible, highly emitting technologies. Yeah, I've seen a few instances in Australia and one or two other places where when they do shut down coal plants, they sell the facilities to renewables 
to some renewable generation organization because you've got all the HVDC, all the transmission infrastructure that can still be utilized, not for the electricity generated from burning coal now, but from having renewables on site. And so it makes a lot, a lot of sense that, you know, you're, you're not scrapping the entire asset. You're just, you know, taking out the furnace and putting in a whole renewables base and then transmitting the energy from there through the, through the existing infrastructure. So I think that's another, another way of doing it as well. Yep. So basically repurposing the, the sites that you already have. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. On the marine side of your business, I know you're on the energy side of the business, but on the marine side of the business, you probably know a little bit about that as well. Is there much movement there towards, well, I know decarbonization is an aim, but let's say the likes of electrification of marine transport versus shifting to more sustainable fuels. And I, I know, you, you know, you're, you're, you're based in Finland, but I've, I've been to Norway and Finland, but it, they have a load of ferries in Norway and they're moving a lot of the ferries because that's an ideal kind of scenario, a ferry just going from shore to shore. They're moving a lot of those to electric. So we're starting to see a rise in the electrification of at least short term marine traffic. Is that something you guys are seeing there as well? Yeah, I think on the marine side, we see a lot of different alternatives, as you mentioned, like for short uh, ferry traffic, then electrification is an, uh, is an opportunity. I think when we look at the longer routes, then it's clearly more towards methanol. Also in Norway, I think there is a lot of different projects with ammonia. So I think actually there is quite a lot of movement on the marine side on, on this topic. And I think also because, you know, if you buy a vessel today, that vessel, you will operate for the next 20 to 25 years. So it's already within sort of the legislative term also of mm. decarbonizing. So it's a very topical thing for, for our customers on the mar marine side to think about now when they make decisions for their future investments. Mm, okay, cool, cool. Where to from here for you guys? I mean, what's kind of next for Wartzilla for the next, uh, Wartzilla Energy for the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years? Well, I think we see extreme growth opportunities of course in in both the energy storage side and and also on on the engine power plant side so i think we we are gonna clearly we have a solid strategy and we are gonna clearly continue on on that strategy and of course continue with with the work we are doing together with our customers but also with with countries to ensure that we can reach a net zero future okay cool we're coming towards the end of the podcast now anya is there any question that I haven't asked that you wish I had or any aspect of this we haven't touched on that you think it's important for people to think about? Well, I think one uh, maybe area which has also been a lot on the news is the uh, energy market reform in EU especially, which is really looking at, at how the electricity market works. And maybe on that one, I would, I would say I think it's very important that we look like holistically at the energy system to understand, you know, how should we build it out and what type of investments should we do and then build also markets that ensures those investments will happen. So now when we look, for example, at the flexibility parts, I think there clearly is areas where we need to have better incentives also to, to invest in the in the flexibility part, which will be a really important and crucial area of the whole energy system. So as mentioned previously, we don't only talk about renewables. We need to look at the renewables coupled with the flexibility, but we also need to ensure that there is the right, right incentives to do those investments. So that's an area which, which is important for us and, and which we are also driving, driving forward. Cool. Great. Anya, if people would like to know more about yourself or Wartzilla Energy or any of the things we discussed in the podcast today, where would you have me direct them? Uh, well, our website, of course, wartzilla.com. Uh, there is a lot of information and then uh, you can, of course, find all of us on, on LinkedIn. Super, super. Great. Anya, that's been fantastic. Really interesting. Thanks a million for coming on the podcast today. Thank you.